Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan, and welcome to Central Park. As always, we're happy to continue bringing the park to you through not only our in-person tours, but also our virtual programs, like our weekly walks, which occur every Wednesday at 1230. Thank you for joining us for another rendition of one of our weekly walks. I'm very happy to welcome you to Central Park for a weekly walk titled Making Waves with me, Ryan, on August 9th, 2023. Now, what just exactly is making waves? Well, we're referring to acoustic waves, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about the science of sound today. Specifically, why so many performers would love to perform in Central Park, and how the park's beautiful landscape designs actually help to really benefit acoustic sound properties. We're gonna discuss a little bit about that today, visiting some sites we may know very familiar, and uh, visit some musicians that help to amplify these spaces, not only physically amplifying sound, but also enhancing the beauty of these already iconic locations. As we begin our walk today, I do wanna thank you for supporting us at the Central Park Conservancy. We're the nonprofit private organization that's cared for the park since 1980, and we couldn't do it without your help. Our mission being to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and the well-being of all. As we make our way through the park today discussing this Making Waves weekly walk, we are using Zoom, so feel free to use the chat feature to say hello. Maybe let us know where you're joining us from, as I see a few people have already done. If you do have a question, use the Q&A feature. I don't have anybody on the back end today, so you'll have to bear with me, and I can answer your questions either throughout the walk or at the end of the program today. I will also launch a few polls throughout our walk today, and once everybody has voted in those, I can share the results and we can see what we're feeling. And on that note, let me launch our first poll, a simple one, it's instrumental to the park. Do you play any instruments? And if so, have you ever performed in Central Park? And performing in Central Park doesn't mean a live performance where thousands of people are coming to see you. Maybe you just set up with an instrument under an arch on a bench or on a favorite lawn and played. Love to see who has played in the park here or if you play an instrument in general. So as everybody votes in that, we'll get into our walk as we begin starting over at a very uh, musical landscape. One that I think has one of the greatest and most easiest connections to music in all of Central Park. So as we begin our walk on 72nd and 8th Avenue or Central Park West, we're going to enter into the park right near the Dakota home of fame musician John Lennon for quite some time between 1973 and 1980, when him and wife Yoko Ono lived here in New York. As we start to enter the park, we're going to come into Strawberry Fields, a landscape that helps to honor the memory of John Lennon and really the Beatles altogether. As when we typically enter these landscapes, we can not only find large crowds of people, but we can also find lots of tunes, melodies, and different sounds filling the air. Many of these sounds coming from oftentimes performers here, or even people just singing along and harmonizing together. As we start to walk through Strawberry Fields, we can almost immediately spot a musician who's helping to enhance this space. We oftentimes find that music helps to not only just give us a better experience, it helps to literally activate a space to fill it with life, fill it with new meaning, or even just enhance its own meaning, oftentimes giving us emotional connection that I think further connects us to this location. And I think having emotional connections with Central Park is one of the reasons we want to care for it and support it so much. As we walk through Strawberry Fields, we can enjoy some of the tunes being sung. On one of our particular walkthroughs, we actually hear Strawberry Fields Forever being sung, uh, the namesake for this location. As we pass by, we can enjoy not only these sites of that gray and white imagined mosaic, but also discuss a little bit about why Central Park is such a great space for music. Some locations like this might be obvious why we have Beatles songs being played, but as we travel through the park, we'll talk about how different landscapes might call or really recommend certain types of music stylings. We'll also learn how some of these landscapes, again, enhance these sounds, helping them to travel further with less physical electric amplification. As we make our way through Strawberry Fields, we're gonna walk through this wild garden. And one of the best parts to me about Strawberry Fields is that you can still hear the music as you walk on some of these back tightly grown in nature walks. Some of these little pathways are the true purpose of the garden, connecting us to this rural escape, but still giving us some beautiful sounds to hear along the way. 
Some of the creators of Central Park, namely Frederick Law Olmsted, really believed that music should kind of balance along with nature. And some of these landscapes, I think you can almost relate them to different types of genres of music. Walking through strawberry fields, we might see some of the rock outcropping still present. Maybe that reminds us of some of the rock and roll music being played. You might find some kind of random and wild growth with some of the trees and their canopies and spreads. I might relate that to more of a kind of jazz and a little bit of all over the place. Might also see a lot of symmetry in some of the park's plants, like this very beautiful oak leaf hydrangea. The symmetry and kind of the almost perfection of this reminds me of almost classical music, something that's a little bit more orchestrated. And as we travel through the park, we can find a lot of these comparisons as we enjoy some of the beautiful flora of this summer season. As we walk down the path, though, we can also hear plenty of music. We're walking a little bit further north now, so we actually are losing sound from strawberry fields, but I'm hearing something else. Hearing a couple different uh, musical sources. Some maybe these birds over here, like this young gray catbird that we can see, who is calling off at, a parrot, at its parrot to come feed it a little bit more. Beyond the birds playing, if we look around through the dense shrubs, we might be able to spot a performing band a little bit lower down. We'll walk by that band and hear where that sound is coming from. But for now, we can enjoy the sounds and the soundtrack it provides other, uh, for our walk through strawberry fields. As we travel a little bit more north, we'll make our way out of Strawberry Fields and cross the West Side Drive, walking along the lake shoreline. As we walk along this way, we have a beautiful day to stroll around the park, and of course, plenty of music filling in the air, helping to remind us that, that life isn't so hard sometimes, and that coming to the park, we can see a lot of world-class musicians performing. I also love the diversity of different genres that we can see performing here. We happen to walk by a band that has a sign up saying Strawberry Sun. So here we can enjoy the musical stylings of Strawberry Sun. One of my favorite elements to this is of course, the beautiful lake view that we get along the way. A very complimenting view that again, is further enhanced by some of the peaceful sounds we hear. And the saxophone player in the Strawberry Sun band is I think hitting the notes just right on this beautiful day as we walk around, looking over people rowing their boats on the lake. And of course, enjoying the nice shady cover of the path we're on. As we make our way down the park, we'll see a few other musicians and we'll talk about how different locations again will enhance these performers. As we make our way down along that west side drive, we're going to start heading over to the east, coming to some areas we're probably pretty familiar with, but we'll enjoy the beautiful walk we have in front of us. Coming around to Bethesda Terrace, what is arguably the most popular section to visit in Central Park and a section that you can almost always find music being performed in. Sometimes an overwhelming amount of music, if I might add. As we start to make our way down into Bethesda Terrace, we can take note of one musician who is set up over along the west side, as well as another musician who is set up over along the east side. A little bit of competition we might have over here, but of course, still having a lot of wonderful music being played. And of course, a wide selection. Maybe if you're bound to one performer, take a few steps the other way, and you have an entirely different song catalog being sung. As we look over the lake here, we can reminisce on really the historical accuracy of music being performed here. When Central Park was created between 1858 and 1873, the lake that we're looking at here would be the first landscape created, finished by the winter of 1859. Just behind the lake, we can see a little bit of that tree line, part of the Ramble woodland, the second landscape created in Central Park and actually finished by 1859 as well. We see concerts occurring in Central Park as early as 1859, the first one occurring in July of 1859 in the Ramble. It actually occurred there because it was, of course, one of the first landscapes finished. And playing music in the Ramble, which is a little bit more hilly than the lake, would allow for the acoustics to travel down and around, reaching to all of the lake shoreline, providing a lot of beautiful tunes for anybody that might be sitting along the edge or possibly even rowing a boat during those summer months. We see this being very interesting because although a permanent music structure would be created a little bit more south here in the park, we do initially see one of the park's creators, Frederick Law Olmsted, really suggesting something a little bit more interesting for the early bandstand. He believed that landscape moves us in a manner more uh, analogous to the action of music than anything else. 
Because of this, he orchestrated that a musical bandstand should be linked and really balanced with the landscape. And because of that, in 1861, Frederick Law Olmsted proposed we make a floating bandstand out on the lake. We'd actually have two different types of style seating, one that would allow for a smaller band that we can see here, as well as one that would account for a larger band or orchestra setup. Beyond that, we can also notice something else in these little drawings. You might notice a little image on the top left and on the top right. If I zoom in on that, we can see an image on the left, which shows where that bandstand could be located when a performance was being held, as well as a picture on the right that shows where the bandstand could be kept when it wasn't in use. So that way it wouldn't disrupt our view from Bethesda Terrace. But where we stand, we'd have a general view of where that floating bandstand would be. This would ultimately allow for concerts to be held on the water, allowing the sound to travel all along the lake, whose shoreline we can see from an aerial view in these photos. Although this didn't actually happen, we do occasionally see a floating 10-man cornet band performing in the late 19th century. As we travel through the park, we will see where the permanent bandstand would eventually end up in 1862. But for now, let's go check out an area that'll help to illustrate how music is amplified and enhanced in Central Park. As we travel underneath these archways, we can go to a nice shady and cool area, none other than Barthesta Arcade, looking uh, very glowing during this time. Again, beautiful summer day as we've made our way past all that really, really humid heat. And now we get to explore some nice, a little bit drier summer weather. But coming into Bethesda Arcade, whether it's scorching hot or a little cool out, we can always enjoy the beauty found along the ceiling. And as we come in here, we can also regularly find a lot of musicians performing here. Now you might be wondering, why do so many people want to perform in Central Park? Well, there's a bunch of different reasons. For one, we have over 42 million visits of people a year, which is a lot. Uh, that is more than the seven most visited national parks in the United States combined. So because of that, that's basically a world audience for you to perform for, especially since a lot of the people coming to the park may not be from the continental United States. They might be traveling from all around the world, which really opens up your audience to a worldwide audience. Beyond that, you can also just enhance somebody's experience. I think the best way to really sum up though why so many people want to perform in the park is by quoting none other than a New York born and raised artist, Alicia Keys. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Beyond that, of course, performing in the park is something of beauty with these surrounding landscapes that also help to enhance, enhance sound. And to talk about why these help to enhance sound, we can talk about really the science of sound. Now, from a physics perspective, sound is vibration. Sound travels from an acoustic wave or as an acoustic wave from a sound source that propagates through the air. It'll propagate through a transmission medium, something like a gas, liquid, or solid. That's basically a fancy way of saying from a vibrating source, a sound wave is traveling out either through a gas like an air, a liquid like a water body, or a solid like the Festa Arcade ceiling. During this time, we're seeing sound coming from an acoustic wave or a vibrating source. Picture the diaphragm in your stomach that vibrates when you talk, maybe a portable speaker that's vibrating to send that sound wave out, or maybe we can look at Carlos Koenig, one of our favorite performers here, who has allowed me to take photos for this, to see how that vibrating acoustic guitar string can help to push out sound. Now, as sound is passing through a gas, liquid, or solid, we can see that being affected in a couple different ways. Those sound waves can be refracted, reflected, or attenuated. We see reflection occurring when it might hit a ceiling like the Festa Arcade. That's known as refraction. And refraction can be summed up basically a uh, good example is an echo. If you've ever made an echo before, you've done an example of reverberation or refraction. This is basically uh, the sound continuing after the sound source stops. So when you yell in a cave and then you stop, you can still hear that echo because it's bouncing off of the walls. It's reflecting and refracting back like we can see here. So as those sound waves travel up, they're gonna hit the ceiling, bouncing out, down and all around. This is one of those reasons that performing under an arch can literally physically amplify that sound and make it sound like you have an electric amplifier. 
And that's one of the reasons it's so easy to perform in Central Park. Electric amplification does require a permit, but acoustic instruments do not. So if you do perform under a setting like this, it'll naturally enhance your sound. And that's one of the reasons that when we go under almost every arch in Central Park, you can typically find some type of performer. I encourage you to think about the science of sound as we travel a little bit to the south now and view about two or three different music venues in the park. Consider how the science of sound played a role into the design during those time periods. So for now, we're going to thank Carlos Koenig for his incredible classic guitar playing, enhancing this beautiful space and giving us a soundtrack to our exploration of Bethesda Terrace and Arcade. We're going to say goodbye to Carlos as we head to the south walking a little bit more to the mall right now, which is nice and lightly packed during this time. Um, it's nice to have a little bit of room to move around. And of course, to see some of our favorite musicians over here like Beethoven. Beethoven's statue, which we can see here, would come up around 1884, being donated by the German American Choir Society of America. And we do see this piece um, being situated in a different location from where it once sat. We do see actually in this photo, you might be able to just briefly notice where my mouse is highlighting on the middle left of this photo, Beethoven's original uh, location. We do see just opposite or where Beethoven is presently, the original bandstand for Central Park that would come in 1862. Frederick Law Olmsted's floating bandstand would never come to be, but we do see another park's assistant park or another um, park co-designer's assistant architect creating this bandstand. His name was Jacob Ray Mould, assistant to Calvert Box. Jacob Ray Mould created an absolutely beautiful bandstand, one that we can see pictured here. Having a Moorish color scheme and frame, it did um, really represent what many people call the most beautiful piece of architecture in Central Park. A blue cupola type ceiling and dome shaped ceiling would be uh, covered with some beautiful decorative cast iron stars that were gilded in 24 karat gold. We also do see um, a lot of other interesting detail that you can't pick up in this photo. Along that blue roof, you would have found inscriptions of various composers' names. This wood and cast iron bandstand supported various styles, uh, various style performances throughout the 19th century and early 20th century. You can see how the acoustic design of this was created back during the 19th century, that kind of almost umbrella-shaped cupola ceiling that would have allowed for sound to travel up and then reflect, reflect and refract back out in kind of a downward umbrella shape, pushing the sound down and out to people that might be sitting along the lawns. We can consider how during the 19th century, this was a very uh, acoustically enhanced structure to perform music for thousands and thousands of people seated all around the area. The flat landscape may have also allowed for sound to space and pan out a little bit easier, not having too much area for it to reflect, reflect or refract from, but of course carrying over to a lot of people, as we can see in this photo, but joining for a Saturday afternoon concert. Over time, we do unfortunately see that bandstand being lost. As we move on, we'll check out what would eventually replace it. But that bandstand that once sat generally over here where Beethoven's statue is today would be slated for demolition by about 1921. After being used for hundreds of concerts, that wood and cast iron bandstand was said to be acoustically outdated and it was demolished. But we do see something else coming to replace it in 1923. None other than the Nomberg band shell. Elkin Nomberg, a retired banker, would donate about $100,000 to create this, which was eventually designed in 1923, designed by William Takau, a nephew of Nomberg, creating this out of Indiana limestone. It did have, at one point, a little bit more of a gilded aspect to some of its domed ceiling shape, but we can see this coffered shaped ceiling. Again, a dome type shaped ceiling, a little bit dome and a little bit different than the cupola dome though we saw earlier on the bandstand created by Mold. This one was considered very acoustically beneficial during its time. But one thing to consider is that acoustics have changed over time. Not only the designs, but also really how acoustic waves are traveled or um, sent out. You can imagine that during the 20th century, electric amplification started to become popular and that technology would increase. When this was designed in the 1920s, it was largely taking into account more of a classical style of music. Because of that, we see it even during its time 
being acoustically outdated for certain styles of performance. It really did support a lot of big band and orchestra style, but for many of the newer genres coming out, the ones that are being developed and really um, evolving more, didn't really make too much sense for it. This concert venue today does see some performances like some Nomberg Nau orchestral concerts. However, you don't find too many, um, too many uh, electric amplified performances occurring here anymore. But over time, you would find a lot of big bands performing here, uh, a lot of orchestras and a lot of dance competitions that would be held. This was a premier band show to be used throughout the 20th century. And it would even be the uh, original location for the Central Park Summer Stage, an organization or rather an event started by us, the Central Park Conservancy. Its first performances occurring in the 1980s and 1986, 1987, before it'd be moved to Rumsey Playfield in the 1990s. As we travel around behind the band trail, we can make our way to Rumsey Playfield, an area you might remember we talked about about a month or two ago on our summer stage weekly walk. As we come up here, we'll talk a little bit about some stuff we did mention a little while ago, but as we come up to this wisteria pergola, we can get a little view of an area that was once a women's viewing pavilion. This was once a section created where basically unattended women could come and watch the performances. Of course, the um, kind of general culture of the time during the 19th century was very different as we may imagine today. And during that time, it was typically seen as unfit for unattended single females to attend the performances without company. So we do see this location being created to allow women to still view those performances. A good example of at least democracy in this park. Even though things were a little different, the designers of the park did accommodate so everybody could enjoy music because music is again, something that brings us together, sometimes challenges the etiquette of traditional maybe viewing and also helps to add a soundtrack and emotion to our park. As we look over this area, we can see again, a location we're probably pretty familiar with, Rumsey Playfield, which is used as the Central Park Summer Stage. In 1994, the City Parks Foundation would uh, take over responsibility of the Summer Stage from us at the Central Park Conservancy. Today, they're the ones who operate this flagship location, as well as the other four that are scattered throughout various boroughs of New York City. Looking in, in the main entranceway, just opposite of where the previous photo was from, we can see this location, which has changed up over time. Now, if you joined us for our summer stage weekly walk a month or two ago, you may remember that this went underwent a restoration in 2019. That restoration uh, featured on a few different things. One of the things it featured on was sound. Looking at the summer stage today, we can see this photo, which I took a few weeks ago um, at one of the performances. This is a band from Denmark called Ice Age, and we can see a little bit of a new stage setup. During that 2019 restoration, a few things were addressed. Uh, different space issues to allow for a little bit more hospitable of a location for performing artists. More room to enhance the capacity, blocking off some of the bleachers that disrupted views in some areas, and addressing the PA system. Now, the reason the PA system was addressed was because, of course, music carries out throughout the park. We can imagine amphitheaters where a stage is put on the bottom and the sound naturally carries up the hill. Central Park having a lot of various topography and even nearby residents means that that music carries far out past summer stage. One of the best spots to listen to the summer stage music is this lawn just south of Rumsey Playfield. It does provide a wonderful location to picnic and hear the music pretty much crystal clear. But you can imagine if you can hear the music crystal clear over here, then that means that a lot of other people might be able to hear some of the performances occurring. This band is uh, from the same performance and they're a group called Horse Girl. <laughs> but um, you can imagine that many people might not know every performer performing. Like you may not, have, may not have ever heard of the last two that I've shown here. Similarly, people that live nearby the park might not enjoy some of the heavy rock concerts or other types of genres that are being performed here. So during that restoration, one of the main things that was addressed was how to keep these shows rocking and keep the sound crystal clear and still loud so we can enjoy ourselves without disrupting, of course, the serenity of people that live nearby. So what was done was basically addressing uh, the, again, challenges we have with summer stage and the proximity to the residents of Pivot Avenue, which are located less than 600 feet away. 
using a various uh, or using a brand new technological system created by K and B Audio Technique. We see this new sound system being applied with temporal data and analysis. Using this type of analysis, we can see various types of park conditions being taken into account, ranging from topography and the hills, including foliage, trees, if the trees have their leaves on them, wind, wind direction and velocity, even things like temperature can actually play effect into how sound is traveling. Even things like precipitation, you might have noticed it's actually quieter when snow is falling. Um, various different things can really play a large, large effect into sound. So we do see this taking into account a lot of different things that we might not even think play a factor in controlling sound. Using this data, tweaks and tunes can be made to various parts of the system to reduce the spillover noise found in various areas. What you'll find on this map is a little noise grid map that shows the yellow areas being a little bit higher of a spillover, but drastically lower than that orange and red area directly next to summer stage. When you're finding um, the large area of blue, that lighter, lighter blue color is gonna be a very, very minimal spillover. One that's equatable to a loud conversation. And it's one of the ways this new system by K and B Audio Technique has allowed the sound, uh, summer stage performances to still again rock on and make it sound like we're in a very, very loud rock concert, but still make it a quiet whisper outside of the park where people might be trying to sleep. This is a great example of how acoustics and needs for the park have changed over time. Originally starting from building an architectural design that'll push the music and make it as loud as possible, going into different designs that are supporting specific genres of music to the evolution of amplified sound, where it's very easy to amplify sound. But of course, we want to tune it and have clear sound and not just a lot of noise. It's really amazing to consider this change that we've seen over time. From this location, we're standing right near two present day music venues, as well as the original one, and not a far walk from some of the first concerts in the park that occurred in the Central Park Ramble, and even some that occurred from a floating boat out on the lake. As we take in a final view or two from this area, we can reminisce again on how far we've come acoustically here in Central Park, and we can consider what the new technologies and acoustics might bring us. As we do come towards the end, I forgot to share the poll, or rather uh, share the results of the poll I launched early on. So I do wanna share those results. And it looks like, looks like we have a lot of people not performing an instrument. I know I definitely um, dropped the ball on performing. I used to play clarinet growing up, not that I was that interested in it, but I always dabbled a little bit in things like harmonica and guitar and I fell off the year. Um, years ago. So I would like to pick that back up and maybe this can be encouragement for you to pick it up and perform in the park because you'll find that the uh, majority of us, 97%, have not performed in the park. And performing in the park is a great way to kind of work up your courage a little bit, maybe get over some insecurities and also get positive feedback. You'll notice that people, again, are very supportive here in New York. Even though it seems like we're really tough, we certainly will stop by and drop you off a compliment. So don't feel discouraged. Definitely encourage you to maybe pick up an instrument and try playing in the park sometime. I do wanna launch the second part real quick uh, for this little poll, which is music in blank. Uh, what is your favorite landscape to encounter music in? I didn't put anything here like some of the actual venues in the park. Of course, there's so many different areas and I feel sometimes putting choices limits it. So I do encourage you if you have an other choice to write it in the chat because I would love to hear some maybe lesser thought of areas that music is enjoyed in the park. Um, as we do make our way through the end of the tour though coming up, I do just want to announce some of the questions that I will answer in the text. But what is the name of the terrace that we visited? So that was Bethesda Terrace and Bethesda Arcade. The spot we currently find ourselves up is a uh, on is a wisteria pergola that was known as the wind um women's uh viewing area and you see somebody thank you for correcting me on the uh pronounce uh, pr proper pronunciation of kapula um of course a word that i am not super super familiar with but uh, kapula relating to that dome type of design from the 1862 band shell we saw and I see another question, did John Lennon ever perform here with just his guitar? Well, I don't know if he ever performed here with just his guitar. He and Yoko did take quite a few walks through the park, several of which were filmed and used for the music video Woman, 
as well as photographs of the two taken in the park, which would be used for the music video, Just Like Starting Over. Both of those songs found on the album Double Fantasy, a 1980 album released just a month before John's death, a collaborative album between him and Yoko. And I'm sure that maybe at some point or another, he may have brought a guitar into the park and maybe strung a little bit, but who knows? Maybe the park was used primarily just as an escape since the music was more of his uh, career and work. But of course, you never know who you're going to find playing in the park before. I've certainly been able to encounter a few lovely musicians performing, especially at Strawberry Fields. So I do encourage you to get out there to check out some of these areas you may know well. Um, I do want to share that last poll and see what majority of people are feeling. And I like how a lot of people have wrote along the water bodies because that was Frederick Law Olmsted's original intention. You have a band performing on a floating bandstand. People sit all along the lake. The sound travels across the lake as acoustic waves spread out. And of course, you have an immensely beautiful view along with a melody and tune giving you that soundtrack. So along the water bodies is certainly a favorite of mine. You might have noticed today we saw about four or five musicians set up along the lake. So water bodies are also, along with arches, a favorite for many musicians. As we do come to the end of our walk, I will take some time to answer any questions we didn't have the time to answer and uh, check out some of your chats because I love to see where you like to listen to music in the park. There are plenty of ways to enjoy music too. And if anybody finds themselves in the park today, you might find uh, today and tomorrow a band called Mount Joy playing at Summer Stage here in Central Park. It is a ticketed performance, but if you do hang out on that Memorial Grove, you will find a beautiful sound coming right at you you'll be able to enjoy a ticketed performance for free. So I hope to see you out in the park. Maybe I'll see you at the show later. But from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, thank you so much for the support. Stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.